Hey Nerdy Knitters, in this video we're looking at the Knitting Guild Association's Master Hand Knitting Program. We'll look at the first two levels, which I've completed, and peek at the third. And we'll also compare it with their new program, the Professional Knitters Course. And you can decide which one might be best for you. And I'll also share some tips that you can use to keep yourself organized while you're working through the program. And I'll have links down below for everything I talk about today. We'll start by taking a look at level one. Once you purchase the program, you'll get a download with all of the necessary files and all of the instructions. Each level includes writing assignments. And for level one, that means a short report on blocking hand knits, which is an important skill for all knitters. Now they don't provide all of the resources that you need. You actually have to get those yourself. You'll have to start building your library and your resources. You can use online resources. And since you'll be a member of the Knitting Guild Association to get the course, they have back issues of their cast on magazine with lots and lots of good information in there. And you'll find lots online, but you should have a few books on hand too, because you'll have to be studying and using those resources in your reports and all of your papers. You can't just show that you know how to knit, you have to show that you know how to research each technique. Now that might seem like daunting and scary, but it's really not. You just take it one step at a time. Another important part of the program is the preliminary swatch because this level really focuses on gauge and finding a good fabric and learning to measure things appropriately, which is also an important skill for knitters to have if they want garments that are going to fit them. The major part of the program is swatching. You'll be working on 19 different swatches. Let's take a look at some of those. These three focus on the basics. You're looking at your basic stitch pattern, seed stitch, stockinette, garter stitch, knit two purl two ribbing, and knit one purl one ribbing. And each of these, you'll have instructions that will tell you exactly how they should be worked. Need to include something called a swatch information sheet. Here's an example of one of mine, where you have to actually show references for each of the techniques. You can't just show that you know how to knit seat stitch. You have to show two references that correspond with your swatch and how to work that pattern. Here's the next set of swatches. These focus on different increase techniques and how to work them. KFB increase, this one's the make one increase and the lifted increase. Now, when you download the instructions for the program, there will be directions for working each of these swatches. It will tell you what to do, but it won't tell you how to do it. It's up to you to decide how each of the increases or stitch patterns is to be worked. And your swatch information sheet, you'll have to record the information that you used and the books or resources that you referenced that show that you executed that, that particular pattern or increase or decrease using that reference. The next set of swatches are decrease swatches. You can see there's four of them here where you'll have to demonstrate various decrease techniques and how they're worked, whether they're blended or full fashioned, and you'll have to research all of those topics. The next set of swatches focus on more textured patterns. You'll have to show that you can do yarn overs in different patterns for simple lace work like this. Here are the cable swatches you'll have to work on, and this part also introduces simple patterns. The program gives you a pattern template to follow and you will work your swatch and write a pattern to go along with it. And after you finish with those cable swatches, the last few swatches focus on two more simple techniques. You'll work on your color work, introducing stripes and a mid row color change. And the final one focuses on seaming, which is a big part of the next level. Every level also includes projects. And for level one, the project is a mitten. You can see right here, they provide the pattern for the mitten and you follow the instructions to work it and it shows that you know how to do proper color changes, decreases and increases, and everything you've learned in this level will be showcased in your final project. And along with the projects and swatches, you also have questions you'll have to answer. Some are general knitting questions and then others relate to certain swatches or the project. And for some, you can just answer the question. For others, you'll have to provide references to back up your comments. You can't just answer off the cuff. You want to provide resources that match the, what you're saying in your response to the question. And then once you finish all of that work, you will package it all up and get it ready to mail and mail it to your co-chair. They will look at your work in detail. They look, I think it takes them about 10 hours or so to review a box that's submitted. And then when they're finished, you'll get a letter along with your box. Here's my first resubmit letter. I did have things to resubmit. And even after that, I still had a few small things wrong that I had to rework again a second time. So 
Don't expect to pass everything right on the first level, but it's really a good project if you like to get nerdy with your knitting. So where level one focuses on the basics, on your increases and decreases, making a mitten in the round, color changes, things like that. Those are pretty basic things that all knitters should know how to do. Level two, the focus is on proper finishing for garments because every knitter should know how to properly fit a sweater and you'll learn that in this level for sure. This is my level two binder. It's a bit bigger than level one. It's the same number of swatches, but three projects instead of one. And like the first level, this one also includes writing assignments. There was more writing with this one. You'll have a report, this time it's on the history of knitting. You'll also have four book reviews. So you'll have to either get to your library or start building your own knitting library at home. So you'll have these resources because you'll need them as you work through the program. The first set of swatches focus on seaming. You can see them right here. You'll be seaming stockinette, reverse stockinette, to rib and a seed stitch swatch. And these probably gave me the most trouble. I had to resubmit all but one of them, I think. These are the originals. You can see there, I did very poorly there. My advice for the seaming swatches is do things very carefully. Really try to match up each edge because you don't wanna be off on your stitch count on either row. Second is the tension. If you find that one edge of your knitting, let's take this as an example like in my original stockinette swatch right here. One edge, my left edge was usually longer than my right edge. So when I was going to seam them up, it really didn't match up very well. So I had to really work on my tension with those swatches especially. So if you have tension issues, you wanna really start researching and figuring out how to adjust those because as you're seaming especially, you'll, those tension issues will come back to haunt you. And once you've demonstrated your basic mattress stitch seams, you'll have some more seams you'll be working on in these swatches right here. I've got four more swatches where you will show your skills with the three needle bind off in short rows, binding off shoulder seams. This one demonstrates what happens when you add a sleeve to a garment, how that should be seamed and working kitchener stitch in garter. So as you can see, almost all of the swatches are just about proper seaming and finishing for a garment. And you'll be working on more lace patterns too. This time, you're expected to write the patterns following the templates, but you'll write the pattern for your swatch. They give you basic instructions about what they want you to do for measurements and your edging, but you're expected to choose your stitch pattern and work your swatches. And these are the two I chose. And I had to resubmit one of these. I had to resubmit one of my lace swatches because I didn't understand decreasing at the time and I would slip my stitches purl wise instead of knit wise when I was decreasing and having to fix that swatch really cemented that knowledge in my mind that when you're working decreases you slip your stitches knit wise not purl wise. And like the lace you'll also be doing cables again this time you get to choose your cable patterns you can see them here. These are the two I chose and you'll also be working on something called cable flare. You'll have to make other swatches to show how you compensate. You can see that what happens here when you have cables, it pulls in the edges of your fabric. So you'll be learning how to help reduce that in your swatching for this level. And you'll also be writing patterns for those swatches as well. And after you've done those lace and cable swatches, which are a nice break from finishing, you have to get back to your finishing work. This time it's with buttonholes. You'll be working buttonholes in different fabrics, in different ribbings here and in seed stitch, and demonstrating how to space them evenly in a stitch pattern. With those swatches, you can really spend a lot of time just researching buttonholes. There are a lot of ways to work buttonholes. And the last two swatches also focus on more finishing techniques. You'll have to show that you can knit a pocket and add a properly set in neckline on a garment. And along with your swatches, you'll have questions again, mostly related to your swatches and projects. So you'll have to provide answers for those and use references to show that you know what you're talking about. There's lots of research for this level. And level two includes three projects. The first is a fair isle wristlet. You can see this one here. I had to resubmit this one. The pattern's provided, but you choose your colors and you have to knit the final project and weave in your ends properly and this one I think I must have knit five or six times and it's still not perfect. The next project was an argyle sock. Now they don't provide the pattern, they expect you to find one and properly do it, but since you'll be a member of the Knitting Guild Association, the Cast On magazine has a few 
different patterns that you can choose from, unless you want to write your own, which you're welcome to do, I believe. Here was my finished sock. And of course you have to choose your colors and work it. Your, this sock is worked flat and then you seam it later on. So you're demonstrating that you know how to seam and work intarsia, which was actually kind of pretty fun. My one tip for that would be to learn how to knit backwards so you don't have to turn your work around because when you've got intarsia going on and all those balls and bobbins of yarn, it can get tangled pretty fast. So that gave me the incentive to work on knitting backwards and I've really enjoyed doing that. It makes a lot of projects much faster. And my tension's actually improved with that method. And the last project is a vest. You can see I've got, still got mine in the bag right here. And I just did a plain stockinette v-neck vest. They have parameters you have to follow, but it's up to you to either write a pattern or find one that you want to follow. That really does show everything you've learned in this level, all of your seams and picking up stitches, your tension, especially where I did just a plain stockinette. My tension issues were pretty obvious and they were pointed out. Now, I found this level to be harder for me. The basic level wasn't so bad because I knew how to work my basic increases and decreases. But when I got to this level, I'd only knit, I think, two sweaters. So it was a real process to learn how to do all of these techniques and all of these different seaming methods. But depending on your own skills, you might find it easier or harder. It, you just take your time and you have to work through it and research and practice. This was the letter that was returned with this one. It's a lot thicker than my first one and I had quite a lot to resubmit. And you can see, I'll link down below to my Ravelry project page and it has a list of everything. I had to resubmit quite a lot and I actually had to resubmit a swatch twice. Thankfully, I only had to mail the one swatch in a little envelope. I didn't have to send my whole box again. Now, if level one is referred to as covering your basics and level two focuses on finishing, level three I've heard referred to as the level where you get to show off all of your skills. If you go to Ravelry, I'll link this down below, but the Knitting Guild Association has a project page set up for each level. So you can see other projects that people have done and all of their swatches and their notes, things that they've learned. If you look at the swatches for level three, you'll see that that's the case. You get to really show off your skills with this level. And the two projects for that level, you have to design and knit a sweater and a hat, and they have guidelines for all of that. And of course, there's more reports and book reviews and things to write. So these, this program really is writing and research heavy. And that's where it differs from the Professional Knitter Program, which is a new program that they've released, which is really focused on those who want to hone their skills but don't necessarily want to do all of this research and writing, which is part of the Master Knitting Program. Because the Master Knitting Program, really, that's the title. You want to really master your craft. And to do that, it's not just knitting, but it's understanding techniques and how to research new techniques and do different things. But the Professional Knitter Program, it's for those who want to work as sample knitters or test knitters and actually show that they have the skills to produce high quality samples that could be used for trunk shows or for yarn companies that want to showcase their yarns. If you go to the website, you can actually see they have some FAQs here and they actually have a page tells you the differences between the two programs. And with the professional knitter program, that one they, they call a course, which means they provide all of the documentation and resources for you. Where the master hand knitting program, they provide the instructions but not the information to execute everything. You're expected to research and learn all of those skills and techniques on your own, where with the professional hand knitter course, they teach you those skills specifically. Now to finish up, I just wanna share a few tips. If you're planning to do either of these programs, things that will help you work through them and keep things organized. First off, I would recommend that you get organized. You're going to need to submit a binder for the master hand knitting program. So if you purchase that and get your page protectors and dividers and get them all set up right away. So as you complete things, when I would complete a swatch, I didn't put it right in my binder. I kept them all in a separate bag so they wouldn't get squished. But all of the swatch information sheets and reports and things like that, when I had finished one set or one particular swatch, I would print everything out and put everything in the binder right away so I didn't have to do it all right at the end. It was pretty much finished. When I finished my final project, I just had to block that and weave in my ends and finish up my final letter for the, the cover letter but everything else was already in there and printed and ready to go. And everything, all, all your swatches and projects will also need tags. 
So I also set those up first. I would sit down one night and I used my computer and I just printed out the, the, their specific information you need to have on them. So you just print them out and have all your tags ready to go too. So especially if you're working, say, all of your increased swatches together, you don't have to sit down after and try to figure out which increased swatch is which. If you keep them organized and tagged right away, then it's all done and just ready to put right in your binder. I also organized things on my computer. I set up a separate folder in Google Drive and then I created templates like the, the swatch information sheet. You have to have the basic, same basic information for every swatch. So I made one master copy and I would just copy that for all of my swatches. And I kept folders and I kept everything like sort of a running document on there. All of my questions, I would have the answers in a document and I would just add them as I went. I didn't do all the questions at once. I would do the ones that related to whatever I was working on at the time and then just keep adding to that document. So it was ready to be printed out and put in my binder when I was done. And I also used Evernote, which is a good resource. It's basically an an online app that you can use to organize lots of information into notebooks. I set up one notebook that was just for that level that I was currently working on and then each note within the notebook would be for one particular thing. I had one that was just for swatches, one that was for questions, one to keep my running list of references that I could just print out later on. So anything I was working on, or if I saw something somewhere that I knew related to a particular question or a swatch, I could add a link or a note to it right there. So I'd always have resources that I knew I could use. My last tip is to start building your knitting library. This is an important part. You'll have to do a lot of research and using references, and you can have some online references, of course, but books are an important part. Some of the things you find online might just be completely incorrect. I've seen lots of videos and things that that things weren't executed properly at all, SSKs that were worked without slipping the stitches first, which isn't technically an SSK anymore. So if I have to recommend just three books to have, I would recommend, if you're visual, the Vogue knitting book. I probably go to this one first. I'm a fairly visual person, so I like to see how things are executed and step by step, and that book really lays it out well and covers a lot of good information. I would also recommend this book. It's an older one, but you can usually find it on Amazon or any place like that. Monsey Stanley's Knitter's Handbook. It's a very dated book, but there's good illustrations and there's lots of good, good information. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And this one, I'm still iffy about, The Principles of Knitting. This is basically your textbook of knitting. There is a lot in there, but her terminology, is different than some of the standard things that we usually say. And also good to have are some stitch dictionaries, like at least one of Barbara Walker's. That will get you through everything you need, at least through level two. And especially for level two, I would also recommend um, Nancy Weissman's Finishing Techniques book. I have a digital copy of that, so I can't show you from the shelf here. But that's a good one to have. She has lots of good information in there that you can use, especially for level two. So there you have it, a peek at two levels of the Master Hand Knitting Program and some information to help you get started if you plan to do it yourself. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe if you like to get nerdy with your knitting.